Welcome back, Tribe. Today we're here with special guest Eric Harris of Black Talent Combatives. He is also the stabilated chapter leader for the state of Georgia. Uh, he is a philosopher, martial arts instructor, and video blogger. Eric, how are you with us today? What's up, man? How are you feeling today, man? I'm wonderful. I'm wonderful. Great. Well, Eric, thank you for taking time out to be with us tonight. And for the audience at home who hasn't maybe caught up with your video blogs yet and may not be familiar with you, give us a little bit of background about yourself and how you got started in the martial arts. Well, I started out, as you know, as you know, some of your listeners may not know, I, I was born with a disability called cerebral palsy, which means, which leaves me chair bound. It's a mild case, but I'm still wheelchair bound. Um, as a result of that, I got bullied a lot as a kid. And when I was about five years old, my best friend, his father ran a backyard boxing type club and I saw him and I saw some of his students working out one day when I was over at their house and he saw me watching intently and he's like would you like to learn I'm like but I'm in a wheelchair now this was me at five years old so my logic at five years old was I'm in a wheelchair he's like so so he took me in and started training me a little bit. Then, as I got further into boxing, he started teaching me other things. Like one day, he gave me a, a um, you know, one of those plastic, those yellow plastic wiffle ball bats we all used to have as kids. Sure, sure. He gave me one of those, and he he said he said he said. He disarmed me, and he said, that's this defanging the stink. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? For years, he didn't tell me. Then in 1991, they moved away, so I didn't, I didn't have anybody to train with, so I pretty much, you know, trained what he gave me. Then there was a local school that opened up in Taekwondo, I believe it was, and that teacher really didn't know, and I hate to badmouth him, but he really didn't know how to train somebody with a disability. And I don't use the term disability. I use differently able. I'll get to that in, at a later at a later moment if you allow me to. But he really not, he really didn't know how to train somebody that was physically challenged. So. I kept going just to have a place to train. Um, after about six months, he closed. So I just kept, I just kept, you know, finding different places to train because I I had been bitten by the bug at a young age, and I just wanted to keep training. Um, and it's been that way ever since. I've trained in uh, various different styles. Um, the be the best style I can say that stuck with me is JKD and the Screamer, and they're just very different systems of a Screamer and um, the bladed stuff that I'm uh, quite adept in. That some well, some people say I'm quite adept. I just think I'm a eternal student. Now, Eric. Early on, when you started training, you said that you you went to a couple different schools. What was the the demeanor of the the instructors of the st other students in the class? Were they accepting? Did they view you in the class as as a positive challenge, or were they upset that you were in the class? Because I, I would imagine, especially you know back in the day, that, you know everybody in, wasn't as enlightened as they are today. Yeah. You know, I'm sure in that, you. In that day, it was somewhat accepting. But you could tell this dude. You you could tell some of them were like, "Hey, this guy's in a wheelchair. How can I teach him this? How can I teach him that?" So I just kept going, and they saw my my drive, and they were like, "He's not going to stop coming until I teach him something." So they taught me, but it was kind of like they didn't want to teach me or didn't know how. And on the flip side of that, you had people that would teach me, that would teach me stuff, 
but they would just take my money and say, oh, you're doing so well. When I really didn't, you know, am I making sense? Oh, absolutely. The absolutely. There's different I'm kinds of instructors stuff. out there. No, you exactly. definitely are. Yeah. So so people had different motives sometimes when they were working with you. Exactly. They had different motives, motives when they worked with me, and it's like, I would look at people that started after I did, and they would get promoted, and I'm like, okay, well, you're promoting them, but they didn't work as hard as I did. And then I would have to work doubly as hard, and I'm not, I wasn't bitter about it, but I'd be like, well, okay, I'm not going to get recognition, but I'm going to keep working. If, and to this day, it's not about the recognition with me. It's about keeping the work, keeping my body able to do the things that most people take for granted. Make sense? For sure, for sure. So what were some of the positive experiences that you had training? And, and you mentioned that you found a home in JKD. Tell me about your, your exploration of Jeet Kune Do and, and where did you get started with that and how did you learn? Well, I started – that JKD started when I was in high school, or I started JKD when I was in high school, because there was a JKD school, an authentic JKD school, that opened up a block away from my high school. And I would go by there, and I'd be like, okay, these gentlemen are doing something that looks familiar. So I went in one day. And the instructor, who's Sifu Bill Price, he's in Orlando now, um, he basically took me in and treated me like a son. And one day we were training in stick or a screamer, and he showed me something. He said, that's the thing in the snake. Now, if you go back to the beginning of my story, I also said that my boxing instructor taught me that. And I, at that point, I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm training a little bit of this. So he, I showed him what I knew, and he built the program around me. He knew how to adjust the program to my, and I don't like to use this term either, special needs. But he knew how to adjust the program to me. JKD was the one system that I felt that would adapt to my disability. And I stayed in there for about four years till high school, high school graduation, and I went away to college. And that, that when I went away to college, that was the inception of what I do now, which is black talent combatives. So, Eric, tell us about black talent combatives. How did you go about creating your own curriculum? What went into it? You know, what were some of the things that you drew from your experiences? I drew p different pieces from what I had learned from different arts because I, during the time that I was formally training, I also had friends that were skills in different arts that would trade techniques with me. Like if I didn't know how to do a particular punch, they would show me their way and then I would trade off. And so during college, it got to the point where I didn't have anybody to train with and there were a few guys that would see me training or working different drills by myself in the Jim, and they came to me and they were like, "Okay, what do you do, and what what are you doing, and why are you doing it?" So I built up kind of like a student base after that. And when I returned from when I returned from college, I wanted to seek my instructor out, my JKD instructor. But his business for his business partner and a few of his other students had told me he had. Uh, going out of business, which come to find out that was a lie, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, as I traded techniques and learned different things, 
and I started my YouTube blog or vlog where I started posting um, things from my instructors that were out of state. I started getting messages from people, different instructors asking me, I have a chair bound student. Can you show me how to teach this to this to this particular student? And at first I was like, Well no, I'm just a eternal student. I uh, I don't know enough but I did know enough for them to pick up something to teach their student. So at that time I said, Okay, let me sit down put a put an actual program together. Now that that pro my program or the program that I teach is constantly going to evolve because I'm constantly learning different things. So anything I learn, if it helps somebody, uh, whether it be a one of the philosophy videos I do or one of the physical drills that I do, if I help someone save a life, whether it be theirs or somebody else's whether they be differently abled or able-bodied, I'm going to do it. And I, I get a lot of hate for that, but I also get a lot of support for it. And I, tr I thrive off both because the hate, the hate just fuels me because if, if they hate you, they're still watching. If you're, in a, if you're able to inspire somebody, who knows who knows the next person they're gonna inspire? And the chain of love always continues. Eric, tell me what what was the story with your Jikundo instructor? What was the truth about what happened? Well, what happened was he shut the school he shut the school down because there wasn't I don't want to say there wasn't an interest, but his business partner, which I hate the bad mountain, but his business partner was basically teaching a different when he would go out of town because he would go out of town because he taught special forces and um, other government agencies, so, shall we say. He would go out of town, but he would leave his business partner to what he thought would be, he would leave his business partner to train his his students. In JKD, well, he wasn't training them in JKD. He was training them in a different system, and he was taking them as students. Make sense? Okay. He was taking he was taking them on as students and telling them, "Well, I can teach you better than this." See for price, and I'm like, "Okay." So when I because I actually sought him out and found out the truth. And when I found out the truth, I was like a little bit ticked off, but I, I understood why he shut down the school because he didn't know he could, he didn't know who he could trust. Yeah, well, that's good that you reconnected with your instructor after all that time. That's that's a mm -hmm. good thing. So, Eric, the and you mentioned you know the 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 hate that you get sometimes, and mm -hmm. I know you get a lot of love because I follow you on YouTube. I follow yeah. you. You know, on Facebook and all your groups. Hey, man, but you've been a supporter since day one, and I thank you for that. Oh no, for sure. I mean, you know, rec just recognizing the good instructor, you know, and but you know the the hate that you're getting. I mean, are people, you know, do people just question you based on on your martial arts experience and say you you know you're not experienced enough or you don't know enough, or are they directly you know focusing in on on the differences that you have, uh, you know, from somebody else and some of the other instructors out there. I've had people do both, to be honest with you, and the hate that they question me, I'm just like, well, because people, people that know me knows who my, know who my instructors are. You know who my instructors are, because we've talked about it, and it's like, okay, you don't know me, but you're questioning what I do and why I do it. You're questioning, I've had some people just come straight out and call me a retard. And that's just, it's not hurtful because I've heard it my whole life. But 
it gets old. And you, I actually considered stopping doing videos for a while, but then, and I'm going to share a quick story with you if you don't mind. I got an email from a a grandmother, and she said her little grandson, who was about five years old, which was the same age that I started, was getting bullied in school. And he he basically saw my videos, and he started doing some of the techniques. It wasn't exactly the technique, but he was getting something out of it. And she said, she said to me one day, she said, you changed your life. That's the point where I said, okay, I can't stop doing this because I'm inspiring people. And then I started getting all these messages from people that I was inspiring, and I'm like, okay, the people that I'm inspiring out, far outweigh the people that I'm not. So if people going to come to me with hate, I say bring them on because it's just going to make me go even harder. Very nice. So, Eric, let me ask you, and, and you, you talked about developing <clears throat> curriculum uh, for people that, that – uh, are differently abled and, and may need some modification to the, the techniques or the, the training strategy. For instructors, as we have a lot of instructors in our network that are teaching classes, open classes, and they may have somebody come into their school that needs that. What advice can you give them if they want to sit down and be very, you know, conscientious and not just, you know, take the student's money like that instructor you talked about? The biggest, if, the, the biggest thing I can say you just keep an open mind. Like if you if you have a student that is chair bound and all you focus on is footwork, okay, try to tweak that footwork so it becomes wheelchair mobility because our footwork, when I say our, I mean chair bound for those of you that didn't get that. Our footwork is wheelchair mobility. So if you have footwork, try to figure out where that would fit in in the wheelchair mobility spectrum. Watch how they move in their chair and adapt the footwork to that. Still teach them the footwork because, and I, I didn't quite understand this until my JKD instructor explained it to me. Still teach them the footwork because they need to know how their how their attacker will move in order to neutralize it. You see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely, absolutely does. So the basically, basically, instructors, from what I'm hearing from you, is that instructors just need to be very mindful and, and yes. be able to make things relate not just to one group of students but to all the students. Exactly. They need to don't look at it as Okay, I need to focus on this one thing. Focus on it and make sure that it in, it includes everybody instead of excludes. Because if if the student if the student whether they be able bodied or differently abled, if the student feels excluded, they're not going to learn anything. They're going to shut down. And once the student shuts down, you're not going to be able to reach them. And they're not going to be able to learn what they need to learn in a self-defense situation. Now, Eric, have you – and your your video blogs, let's talk about that for a little bit because you've got, you know, tons of followers on, on YouTube. People, you know, are constantly – I see your, you know, your videos reposted everywhere. And I, I like your channel because it's a, it's a nice mix of – you know, your philosophy videos and also your technique videos. And, and I know your whole series is the, you know, the chair bound to scream out. Um, you know, what, what goes into the process of doing the videos? I mean, I understand you, you know, you want to reach out to people and, and you're, you've discovered that you're inspiring people. Um, but what are your goals, you know, for your video channel? What do you my, want to get across to people? My goal, my ultimate goal is this. Able-bodied, able-bodied people don't realize, a lot of them do not realize that 
the chair bound can do the same thing that they can do just in a different manner. Hence the term differently abled. Because if you look if if you look up the term disabled, and this is the reason why I don't like it, if you look up the term disabled, that means unable to function. That's not um the physically challenged or that's not the chair bound with whatever disability we have, we just need help to do the things that the able-bodied people will take for granted. So we do it in a different manner. Like I said, hence the term differently abled. So my ultimate goal is to show the able-bodied people we are all brothers and sisters. We all need help in some way, shape, or form. Don't discount us just because we're um, chair-bound or blind or whatever. We all have a disability. Some people can't do math. Some people can't uh, do construction. A lot of people will say that's a disability. But if you look at it, we're all brothers and sisters. I hope that um, kind of uh, answered your question. Oh, most definitely did. And, and Eric, I want to ask you, you know, specifically about the physical training. You seem to gravitate towards the weapon-based arts. You know, I, I see you with your big old Bowie knife all the time and your sticks. Sure. And I wanted to get your opinion. I mean, just from a practical perspective, you know, do you feel that weapon-based arts are something of maybe more value to people that are differently abled? I mean, does it does it help to kind of compensate for, you know, some of the other things that you might not be able to do? Yes, and I'm going to tell you why real quick. Um, look at Kali. Kali, anything you can think of in Kali, anything you see around you becomes a weapon. So that challenges the mind. That, and if you challenge the mind, the body follows. I'm not saying you're going to get up and walk, but it's going to allow you to do different things that just sitting at home would, if you just sit at home, it wouldn't come to you because you're not challenging your mind. But if you're challenging your mind to do that, to make that particular thing you're looking at a weapon, what else can you do? So that's the way I look at Kali. That's the way I look at uh, knife fighting and several of the Filipino martial arts. Because if I can challenge my mind through that, what else can I do? What else can I challenge my mind to do? And what else can I achieve? It's, it's like this, and it's something I live by. See it, believe it, and achieve it. Because if you see it, you can believe it, and then you can achieve it. But definitely wise words, Eric. Eric, let me ask you, you, you gave us some, some insight and some advice for, you know, the able-bodied and how they, you know, view training with somebody that's differently abled. What advice do you have to people that are differently abled? I'm sure that some people, I know some people I've met in my own personal experience are very much like you. They, they don't, you know, they don't see an obstacle, they just see a challenge, you know, and they take it head on like a challenge. But I've met other people and, you know, being a martial arts instructor, you know, I've invited people to come try a class to come, you know, spend time with us. And I've I've encountered some people that will just shy away. And I, I think, you know, in speaking with them, I kind of detect sometimes that they might be afraid of what uh, the other classmates might think or they're, you know, they're concerned that they're, they're not going to fit in or they're not going to be able to keep up. What advice do you have to people that are missing out on, the, you know, that wonderful experience of training that all of us, you know, are addicted to? Um, don't give, Don't give up. Just keep going. Keep going, and you'll find something you love. And then the martial arts, to me, is like a brotherhood. And if if we give up, 
we miss that brotherhood. We become hermits. We become what people, ex what society expects of us. Don't give in to what society society wants you to do. Think outside the box. Open your heart. Open your mind. Because once you open your heart and your mind, there's nothing that can stop you. Irregardless to if your legs don't work. Irregardless to if your eyes don't work. If you open your heart, doors will open for you. So take that risk. Take that challenge. Yes, you may get hurt, but it may teach you something. It may teach you how to avoid getting hurt the next time. So if, if you take a challenge, it's going to open you up to many opportunities. Don't miss out on the opportunity. Because if you miss out on the opportunity, you miss out on a blessing. And if you, if you are blessed, then you be, can become a blessing to others. Now, Eric, let's let's switch gears a little bit. And I, I mentioned your your video blog, <clears throat> and you you on the blog you teach martial arts, but you also have you know your philosophy you know lectures on there. Mm -hmm. And I ask all of the guests that come on. At least I try to ask all of the guests to. Mm -hmm. You know, give me their thoughts on warriorship because our, our Raven Tribe is dedicated to developing warriorship and developing strong warriors, not just, you know, on the mat, not just punching and kicking, but just in life. And I want to get, you know, uh, an answer from Eric the Philosopher now, not Eric the Martial Arts Instructor. But mm. give, me your, give me your views on warriorship. What is a warrior? A lot of people would call you a warrior. Um, but what do you think, you know, encapsulates and defines what the warrior is? And what should the warrior be doing, you know, outside of the gym to be a better person? Warriorship is not about picking up a weapon or learning a kick or learning a punch, okay? That's about helping your fellow man survive, helping your fellow man become better. It's all about the betterment of mankind. If, if it's all about weapons to you your or learning a kick or a punch, you're empty-minded. You see one-dimensionally. But if you open your heart and try to figure out a way to help your fellow man through whatever it is, whatever art you do or whatever task you're performing, if you're able to help your fellow man, that... Let me back up. If you're able to feel, help your fellow man through their challenges and help them navigate through some of their challenges, that's warriorship. And having love in your heart for your fellow man, dis despite what they may do, do to you or think of you, that's warriorship. Excellent. Well, Eric... Thank you for taking time out to speak with us. I really appreciate you being on. Do you, mind, do you, do you mind if I give uh, a few of my instructors a shout out for real quick? Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So let's, uh, let me ask you to do this, Eric. Can you tell the audience at home where they can find you on the, on the net? Um, if you can tell them about your YouTube channel and where they can find all your videos. And then, by all means, please uh, you know, give some respect and love to the people that respect and love you. Well, on my YouTube channel, it's uh, www.youtube.com slash NinjaXTX. And I have over a thousand, I counted today and I have over a thousand videos. I didn't realize I had that many, but I have over a thousand videos on there. On my YouTube, it's, uh, I believe it's www.youtube.com slash Ninja. XTX. On Facebook, just type in Eric Harris, Georgia, or I believe it's Eric Harris, Cartersville, Georgia, and you can add me that way. And if I if I don't add you right away, I probably will. 
just let me know that you've listened to this show and you like what I have to say, you like my message, and I'll add you because if you like this show, you're you're of the same heart. So you're not a hater, so I'll add you. Um, that's other than my Facebook group for Black Talent, which is in, invitation only. You're in there, I believe. Um, those are the two ways you can get a hold of me the best. And Eric, uh, by all means, give a you know give your shout outs to the people that are important to you, man. I want to give a shout out to uh, Guru Chris Nally. Um, he was the one. He is the one that's responsible for getting me involved in Serato, uh Serato Screamer. I, I am considered a second generation student of Grandmaster Angel Cabalas. And if it had not been for him, my career wouldn't be where it is today. And I want to thank him. I also want to thank a person that I consider a brother, um, Guru Stephen Ledwith. Ledwith. He, uh, if it hadn't been for him, man, I wouldn't know some of the people. Some of the people that have, have enriched my life, and he's enriched my life in a way that he would never know. So I wanted to thank. Um, um, hold on a minute. Master Ron Saturno, my direct Serata instructor. Man, I can I consider him to be like the pinnacle of Serata. Along with Carlito Bonjock, somebody that inspires me every day. Along with, and this is one of the best instructors I know when it comes to boy knife along with uh, Master at Arms, James A. Keating. He's the Yoda of knife fighting. He's a, heck, to be honest, he's the Yoda of fighting because he knows everything. I hate to put it like that because some people don't want to say you know everything, but when you actually sit down and talk to this man, there. It blows my mind what the man knows. I just have to tip my hat to those people because if it had not been for them, doors would not open for me. So now I'm paying it forward by opening doors for those that may not know how to open doors for themselves. All you got to do is step through. Then, as you step through, the journey becomes your own. But you have to be willing to step through the door. And thank you for those that inspired me to do so. Well, Eric, thank you again for being on, and very wise words from you. I know that your message is going to reach out to a lot of people, and I encourage everyone to look you up. You know, there's definitely something for everybody to learn from your video blog, from talking with you. So once again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for being on with us today. No problem, brother. I'll be in touch soon.